Well, good afternoon, Matt. I am good so glad Paul. that you are here. I am super excited to talk to you. So for those uh, listening, you and I connected maybe three weeks ago on LinkedIn. You shared with me that you at you turned 50, quit your job as CEO of a PE-backed company, packed and sold your house and moved 1,800 miles across country and bought a machine shop. Talk about a midlife crisis, but one of the best single career decisions you've ever made. And the single word you described is freedom. Fantastic. This is not something most people do uh, after they turn 50, but tell me more about that. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your decision to buy a machine shop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, I, I love doing these. And I think it's really valuable to do these. And, and I would encourage any business owner to do things like this because it makes you be introspective about your business. And um, that's always a great thing. But uh, yeah, so I, I'm 51 years old now. Um, I, I, I ended up buying um, the machine shop or my wife and I ended up buying the machine shop uh, um, you know, one month after my 51st birthday. And uh, so, so um, my, my birthday present to me was, was the gift of freedom. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as you said, I, I was the CEO of a private equity backed company. Um, I had a manufacturer of, of plumbing fittings. Before that, I was the CEO of a different private, private equity backed company that, uh, you know, I, I led on a growth path from $10 million in sales to $125 million in sales, had a really successful exit uh, for those PE owners. And, 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 and actually that, that exit happened at the end of 2019. And, okay. and uh, at the time, uh, you know, I, I, when you're the CEO of a private equity owned company that gets sold to another uh, private equity owned company, you, you tend not to get to keep your job because, you know, there's, there's sure. already a CEO and, and you don't need two of them. And so I actually had the idea then that I wanted to buy a machine shop. I had uh, become exposed to them and, and really fell in love with them and, and, you know, what CNC machines could do and, and uh, the variety and flexibility and scalability of these businesses I thought was, was astounding. And, and so I had this idea that I would buy a machine shop then and had built a whole thesis around uh, taking and, and growing a machine shop. And, um, you know, then the pandemic hit and, uh, you know, I didn't quite know what to do. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of buying a business, um, you know, while I was sitting there in my house, not able to go really anywhere um, for several months, uh, just mm -hmm. seemed seemed overwhelming. And so I didn't end up taking a uh, a job as a CEO of a, of another private equity owned manufacturer. Uh, but you know, it just wasn't it wasn't fulfilling anymore. You know, I I'd, mm -hmm. I'd been on that journey. I had, I had had success on that journey, and and it wasn't something that I that my heart was really in. And, and, um, you know, I came home, uh, around Thanksgiving of last year and, uh, said to my wife and my family, I said, you know, I don't know that I can keep doing this. This is just, uh, just not for me anymore. And, mm -hmm. and I really want to do this machine shop thing. And, you know, and I had never given up on the idea and, and, you know, the machine source name, and, and, you know, we can talk about that, but the machine source name, I had already um, like registered the, the <laughs> website. I owned the domain. I had, I had done a trademark search, right? I had done all these things um, like a year before that even, and, and, you know, never given up on it. It was still, you know, paying to hold on to the domain. And, and so, you know, by Christmas, um, you know, instead of having a midlife crisis where I, you know, bought a Corvette and, you know, grew a goatee or something, um, you know, I, I got a Harley, uh, you know, yeah. I, I quit my job and, and uh, bought a machine shop. And, um, you know, it's like, like, like you, 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 you said at the beginning, it's like the best decision I've made. We're only, you know, what is it? It's August 22nd. So uh, owned the business for three months than 21 days at okay. this point. Yeah. So, you know, we're just getting going. 
Yep. But, uh, you know, I'm really excited about, you know, how far we've come and and the the journey that we're about to go on yeah you said your you said your run rate is already up 50 percent in the last yeah actually as of today um so you know i bought the business the, the i'll just just be really yeah i do want to get it, into that how you found yeah. it how you bought yeah. it how you, what you so negotiated the, the, the business i bought was you know somewhere between 450 and $500,000 worth of revenue the last couple of years. Um, it had been kind of slowly atrophying. Um, you know, the owner was, was really no longer out selling and, and, and marketing the business. And, you know, he had a couple of core customers that, that kept coming back. But, but even there, um, those customers would send him work to bid. And a lot of times he was just saying, no, I don't want to do that or that part just seems like too much work or, mm -hmm. you know, um, oh, I'm going to have to send that out for Anno. That's too much work or, or whatever it is. Okay. And, and so, you know, it had been slowly, slowly year by year, losing a little bit of sales. Um, and, and, you know, but it was, it was a great business with, with, you know, a lot of capacity with great, well-maintained machines, um, and in a great market. So, mm -hmm. you know, I felt like it was, it was the, the right thing to do. And, and yeah, the run rate is up. Um, you know, w when I started, we were looking at backlog of, and, and, you know, I tend to define backlog as sort of the next 20 to 30 days. We do have some orders now that actually go out two years. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, if I'm just looking at the next, at, at the sort of the next 30 to 45 days, you know, our backlog was like 25, 30 grand when I started. Um, and uh, today with the last couple of work orders we put in, it's at 90. So wow. um, yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of growth in, in the last, you know, call it three months. And, and really I didn't even start selling till, till June. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's demand out there if, if, if you can turn it up. Yeah. So I want to talk about a bunch of different things. One sure. in our LinkedIn chat, uh, as we were getting to know each other, you described your Machinosaurus operating system, which mm -hmm. is comprised of the selling system, the quality system, the manufacturing system, basically EOS for those that mm -hmm. know traction, mm -hmm. um, plus a bunch of other systems. And uh, so I'd love to dig into that. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was impressed by when you sent over kind of your vision statement, uh, just even having a vision statement and then mapping out, you know, the amount of uh, revenue and number of jobs and people and like down to like the work order level value. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's something that a lot of shop owners do. Uh, and so I'd love your take on the importance of those things and how that maps your trajectory and kind of sets the vision. So mm -hmm. let us, ha let, yeah, let us have it all. Okay. Um yeah, so so just to just to, to to provide the framework, you know, the Machinosaurus operating system is is what we coin all of the different systems we use to run our business. Um, and if I'm being perfectly frank and and you know maybe a little too transparent, um, you know, one of my goals or one of our goals, one of my and my wife's goals is to you know hire a CEO to run this business really within 36 months. Um, okay. because, because truth be told, um, the only thing I really like doing is selling. Um, and the rest of it is kind of, you know, um, and, and I like hanging out with the guys, but, but you know, the, the other, the other stuff, um, I think, um, we could get somebody else in to do. Um, not that I haven't been a CEO before, of, of course, um, you know, okay. I've been a CEO of a hundred million dollar plus businesses before. But but the machine source operating system describes all of the different systems and processes we use to to drive our business. So we have the machine source selling system, which defines the the selling effectiveness, selling management, um, selling activities, and, and all the other things that, that go into making sure that we are always selling. You know, with, with apologies to, to David Mamet and, and Glenn Gary Glenn Roth, 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, he, Alec Baldwin said, always be closing. Uh, yeah, it's, that's kind of true, but I think always be selling and, yeah. and, you know, making yeah. sure that we are putting all of the pressure in the business on the operations and fulfillment rather than, you know, running into a, 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 a dull patch where, where, yeah, yeah. you know, um, all of a sudden it's, hmm, we better go get some sales because it takes a while. So, yeah. so yeah, it our, defines I'll, just, of, I'll just interject there for a second if yeah. I can. So at our shop, we called that positive sales pressure. Mm-hmm. And before we learned the lesson of always be selling, there were times where we were flush with work and there were times where we weren't. Yeah. And the times where we weren't, you could easily wipe out three to six months worth of profit in one or two months of, of you know, below break even, yeah. uh, especially if you're not wanting to let your folks go, which you don't because they're hard to <laughs> re-attract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I certainly uh, resonate with that importance. And I think it's particularly um, germane because so many shop owners don't have this as a primary goal, goal, a primary you know thing that they think they're good at. Like you think you're good at it. You like doing it. Um, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit at my shop, but most shop owners don't. And I, and, and I love the idea of like, if you have a revenue goal and you know what your average work order value is, then you know how, and you know, like your conversion rate for a conversation to a customer and that sales cycle length, right? You got to crunch all these numbers to figure out, yeah, how, how often, when you sell, right? You know, and, and that's exactly right. You know, um, like, like you and I talked about, uh, I know exactly how many work orders we need to to gain every single month, um, whether it's 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 for, you know, the goals that we have for August or the goals we have for, you know, August a year from now. And and, you know, what the average size of that work order needs to be. And you can actually stack that all the way back up to, OK, this is how many new people I need to find, um, you know, every single day. And, and, you know, the, the thing I'll say about sales is, is, you know, I think a lot of people have, have a misnomer about it. Sales is a skill set that can be learned, that can be taught. And it is no different really than, you know, the skill set that a machinist learns or that, you know, any, any other type of operating person learns. Um, you know, we tend to think of sales as like the guys with the slick back hair and they were, you know, the really social people and, you know, they, they love to go golf and, you know, they, they, they drink a lot and, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and, and, you know, look, I'll tell you straight up, um, I've made my career in sales and I hate golfing because the idea of spending five hours doing anything that doesn't either involve working on my business or spending time with my family just seems ridiculous. But, right. you know, and that's me and everybody else is different and that's okay. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it is a skill set that can be learned. It is a process that can be taught. And if you adhere to the process and you make the appointment with yourself and keep the appointment with yourself to follow the process, then you're going to have success. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, you know, um, and that is the selling system. It is about, you know, understanding how many people you need to touch each day, um, how many people you need to follow up with each day, how many people you need to have a meeting with each week. You know, we have little rules within our selling system. So we call it three by three by three. So three hours of research, right? Identifying new prospects. And that could be anything. You know, I might now tell you, one of the things that I love to do is about every six weeks, I go on to indeed.com and I look at who's hiring machinists. And I find all the local companies, not the machine shops, um, although, you know, I would sell to a bigger machine shop, but, but, you know, all the local companies who, who have, you know, CNC machinists that they're trying to hire. And, you know, then I go on to LinkedIn and I figure out who I need to contact at that company. And, you know, then, then. That, that is a you know, brilliant master move, right? My friend. <laughs> awesome. I mean, I mean, look, if they're, if they need machinists, then they need machined parts. And, yeah. and, They're you know, the reality is work. that, um, I haven't run into one yet where they've told me like, you know, go away. We don't outsource any work. Um, right. in fact, usually if I get a response, it's, oh, great. Can you quote something for me? Or what's your lead time? <laughs> or, you know, can you work with titanium? What about syntactic foam? What do you think about syntactic foam? Right. And, and these are the kinds of questions that I'm getting back. And, yeah. and, um, 
You know, so that's, that's one piece of the selling process, right? And then I've got five by five, right? You've got five days in a week. You really should have five planned scheduled customer interactions. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, as someone who, who ran, you know, bigger companies and, you know, had a sales force of 50, 80 people rolling up to me, um, you know, the, the thing that, that always like drove me crazy is when a salesperson person would come back and say, oh, I had a great meeting with so-and-so, there, something's definitely going to happen. And I'm like, well, what's a great meeting? Like, what does that mean? And, um, you know, they couldn't really ever tell me, right? And so, you know, when I say a planned, scheduled interaction, what I mean is that, you know, it is a meeting that you prepared for. It is a meeting where you had an objective going into it, where you wanted the customer, because you know every customer interaction should actually involve investment by the customer. If the customer doesn't invest and and do something as part of the meeting, then they're not really bought into the process. And you know um, you want to make sure that as a salesperson, you're spending your time where you can get a sale, and you're not spending your time where you know you're just kind of you know shooting in the dark. And and, um, you know, I call that win fast, lose fast, but, um, you know, and that's also part of the selling system, you know, and then we've got the manufacturing system and the manufacturing system is really, you know, the standard operating processes that we use to run our business. So, you know, um, and, and it's interesting, Paul, you know, you've got pro shop and, and, uh, look, we're going to buy a pro shop and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about the right time to buy a pro shop because you know i bought this shop that had really no processes and um so you know we're driving a lot of process change and a lot of organizational change right now and you know we had already within the eos language established our rocks for the quarter so we're not going to do it right now because you know we as a group sat down and decided you know what it is we're going to do for this quarter and i you know i don't want to change that on them just because you know i got some new harebrained idea <laughs> Uh, For those yeah. not familiar with EOS, can you just talk about the rock, yeah. the, the model a little bit, the rocks? Sure. And... sure. The EOS is, is the entrepreneur operating system. Um, and, and, you know, if you want to learn more about it, you can find the entrepreneur operating system, you know, on the internet, just Google search it. Um, and there's also a book called Traction, which is really sort of where it started. And, you know, if I had to characterize it, what I would say is the EOS is a set of tools um, that entrepreneurs can use to organize their business. Within EOS, you know, what they found was, you know, there's sort of certain key things that you as an entrepreneur need to get your hands around. And if you get your hands around those things, a lot of the chaos in your business will go away. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, um, excuse me, one of the, 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 the key things that, that it really, it doesn't explicitly say this in the book, but, but how I would characterize it is it helps the entrepreneur go on the journey from being an entrepreneur to being a CEO. Right. And, you know, um, look, as entrepreneurs, you know, there's a certain amount of sweat equity that we all have to put into our businesses. And there's a certain amount of saving our way forward that we have to do in our businesses. But ultimately, if your business is going to grow, you can't do the $20 an hour thing as you yeah. know, which is what the entrepreneur does. You got to do the hundred dollar an hour thing. And, and, you know, um, not that I'm incapable of cleaning the bathroom, but it's probably not the best use of my time. And it's not the best thing for the organization for me to be doing that. You know, mm -hmm. that said, I cleaned the bathrooms here last week. So, sure. you know, um, but, but, you know, that is, that, that is, that is, you know, what the entrepreneur operating system is. And, you know, the other way you might say it is, is it is like a, um, light beer version of, you know, what a large multinational conglomerate would use to run their business and, you know, cascade their goals throughout an organization. Um, mm -hmm. The thing I really love about it the most is that, you know, it's not about the entrepreneur setting the vision and sort of, you know, driving the company forward. It's about, you know, the, the, the the biggest value to me, I think, is when you get the whole team involved. Um, and, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm a little bit all over the place here, but, you know, I remember when I learned about the eight forms of waste and lean. Yeah. And um, my favorite part of that is, 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 is the whole concept of, 
you know, wasting intellect and, you know, not asking the team how to do things better. And, um, you know, machinists are smart, like they're smart, creative people. And, you know, if we just sort of, you know, give them some power and, 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 and some, some permission and some encouragement, like, Hey man, sky's the limit. Um, so that's, you know, that's the machinosaurus, you know, manufacturing system, right? Like, so what we set up is, you know, it's the, every job gets a cart and the tools go on the cart and the boxes that the parts are going to go into go on the cart and the first article inspection sheets, et cetera, et cetera. Right? All that goes on the cart and that goes to the machine. And then, you know, and the little program on the stick and, and everything else, right? And, yeah, you know, off you go. Um, and, and, you know, the machine source manufacturing system describes that process. Um, it's very closely integrated with the QMS. Um, so the quality management system and, you know, that like our QMS, the one we've written and the one we're implementing, um, is no different than any other, you know, ISO 9001, um, you know, ASI, uh, quality system that you've seen. Right. Mm -hmm. It's got all sort of the 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 parts and and, you know, really, those are those are sort of the key processes that we've identified now. And they all fit in with within the machine to source operating system. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the idea is that we have defined and documented um, and set expectations for everybody in and around the business so that, you know, there's no real ambiguity about, you know, what you're supposed to be doing and when, um, you know, we've done it in a bottoms up collaborative way using the, the EOS framework. Um, so it's not like, you know, I walked in the door and was like, Hey, here's a, you know, 130 page QMS go, you know, sure. we, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we, we came up with it together and, right. and, um, you know, and that, so that is the, the machine of operating system. Sorry, long answer. Yeah, no, it was a great answer. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, so you learned, did you specifically use uh, EOS at, as the CEO in these larger companies or um, something very similar? So I, I became exposed to EOS. Um, you know, I was running these larger companies and, you know, uh, we were buying other companies. Um, that was part of what we were doing. And, you know, a lot of the companies that we bought or many of the companies that we bought, I shouldn't say all of the companies or even a lot, but, but, but many of the companies that we bought were using EOS. And my observation was that um, those that were using EOS tended to be a lot easier to integrate into the larger organization, tended to have, you know, um, you know, like fewer, oh, I didn't know that kind of things pop up, um, right. warps, if you will, as you went through the, the, the integration. You know, because like you can go out and look at a business and do the due diligence and you know buy a business and you know at the end of the day you don't know what you bought till you got it um Mm -hmm. that's kind kind of like when the you know all the laundry comes out and you find out you know oh this is where they keep the brooms and oh they don't really you know do these things that i thought they did um and so like those eos companies tended to be you know um a lot stronger than those that weren't and, um, you know, I always sort of kept it in the back of my head. It, it wasn't really a fit for the organizations that, that, you know, I was running, you know, because with a private equity sponsor and the data requirements and, 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 and those sorts of things, it's, you know, you need a lot more rigor and a lot more analysis in those businesses than you're typically doing with EOS. But, okay. you know, I thought it was a great system and, and, you know, always had it in my head as, as a great thing to do in a smaller company. And, you know, I think, like I said, it's, it's, it's got so many great organizing principles, but it's also got such a light touch about it um, that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, there, there's two kinds of ways to take your medicine and one is a lot more pleasant and, you know, EOS just sort of helps you, helps you do that. Yeah. 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 No, uh, uh, there's just an incredible amount of wisdom there, I think, in the strength of those business processes 
and see, seeing firsthand how that affected the operations of those companies that you guys would acquire. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's one of the more important aspects of my own shop, you know, in our success in growing it and eventually exiting it. Um, and uh, it's also a sort of a tenant of what we believe at ProShop as well is that um, the most valuable companies are ones that are run on well-established, uh, well-understood collaborative business processes that everyone's invested in. So, yeah. Um, well, you know, and, and actually, the, I mean, I'll tell you the feedback from the team um, and we have some folks who've been here for a while and mm -hmm. then we have folks who, you know, we've hired in um, and the, the sort of the unanimous feedback is I love that it's so collaborative. I love that you actually, you know, sort of sort of take our opinions into account, um, you know, um, and and. You know, one of our, you know, as part of EOS, you define your core values. And, you know, I think I'd be remiss if, if I didn't say that, you know, EOS or in my experience, any growth enterprise has to start with a set of core values. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a number of ways to get there, you know, um, but, but, you know, the way that I found the most successful over the years is where you get the entire organization, you know, involved in defining and articulating what those core values are. Mm -hmm. Now, look, the reality is they're not terribly different from organization to organization. And, you know, even as we were going through the process here at Machinosaurus, um, you know, I kind of knew what we were going to get to, um, you know, but, but, but you know, had to let the team get us there because mm -hmm. that's the only way that they're then invested. And, you know, everything sort of Christmas trees off of those core values. Mm -hmm. um, and, so you, and so, you know, that's an important part of EOS. It's an important part, I think, of any growing business. Yeah. So you have, you sent me them. Uh, you have four yeah. of them. Uh, do yeah. the right thing. Do what you say you will do. Get better every, every day. And we are family. Uh, and, and I agree that many companies have similar ones, although those are certainly, you know, there's so many others, like you could have collaboration, you could have kindness, mm -hmm. you could have whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I love some of the little subtext underneath these, like do the right thing. We live our lives as if our moms are watching, right? That's <laughs> such a... Mama knows best, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, like, look, if you're living mom. your life not to hack off your mom, <laughs> you're probably going to be okay. <laughs> yes. And so your team, the, the, the folks that were there when you bought it, plus some mm -hmm. of the new ones, perhaps were collaboratively built these four values. Is that true? Yeah. So what, 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 you know, the, these were invented in May, um, mm -hmm. after, after we, we started the business, you know, I, every Monday or Tuesday, it just kind of depends on the week. Um, you know, we sit down, I bring in lunch. Um, and we, we talk about where we're going to take the organization. Um, mm. and, and, you know, the, I brought in the traction books and I, and I, and I handed them out to all the guys. I said, look, you don't have to read this, right? You don't, this isn't homework. Um, but you know, let me tell you what it is. And, and I explained it and I said, you know, this is a way for, you know, us to organize our business and, you know, I'd really like you to give it a chance. Um, and, you know, the first thing we have to do is decide, you know, what our vision is and what it is we want to accomplish. And, um, you know, that was actually at the same time that I rolled out the bonus program that I have for the team. Oh, there you, go. Um, you know, I've bought or been part of buying a lot of companies from entrepreneurs who, you know, founded and built companies, and, you know. $10 million companies, $20 million companies, $30 million companies. And, you know, without fail, what I've always observed after you buy one of those companies from one of those entrepreneurs is if they weren't generous in sharing rewards of the business with the employee base, then, you know, what you generally are acquiring on the other side is a bunch of pretty upset people who feel exploited. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, basically I've given them 20% of the business. Um, right. 
you know, and, and, you know, that applies to any cash that gets distributed. Um, and, and really, even if we were to sell the company down the road, they're getting 20% of the proceeds. Um, and, you know, because without them, we won't achieve what, you know, my wife and I won't achieve what we want to achieve. And, and, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. And, and that sort of became the, okay, guys, um, you're not just, you know, employees, your owners. And, you know, what is it we want? And, yeah. you know, it became like a free for all. Well, we should make this and we should do this and we should get a fifth access machine like right now. And <laughs> you know, um, it was like, okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had to kind of direct them. Uh, I said, well, you know, look, let's define where we can be in 10 years. And, you know, it should be a B BHAG, right? A big, hairy, audacious goal, right? Mm -hmm. It should seem impossible. It should seem unimaginable. And, you know, so we set it out. And, you know, we said that this sub $500,000 company wants to be like a $50 million company in 10 years. Right. Um, and then, you know, we backed it up just like EOS teaches you into, you know, okay. Um, so now we got this idea of where we want to be in 10 years. Um, in order for us to know that we're on track for hitting that, in 10 years, where do we got to be three years from now? And what does that look like? And then, you know, uh, we take, we back that up into, all right, where do we got to be a year from now? Um, mm -hmm. And then we broke that down into, you know, okay, what is it we need to do in the next 90 days to, you know, so that at the end of 90 days, we've done all the things we think we need to do to put us on track to meet the one-year goal, which puts us on track to hit the three-year goal, which puts us on track to hit the 10-year goal. And look, it's not going to be linear and it's going to change. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, it's a great organizing principle. And this all does come from, you know, EOS and, and traction. And, and again, like the most, the, the best part is, is, you know, um, I'm like the shepherd rather than, you know, the person who's, who's got like a board in my ear saying you need to get to this number by this day. And, yeah. you know, we need to make four times cash on cash and, and I, I don't have to do that anymore. Sure. Um, so, so do you, so the rocks are those 90 day yes, correct. goals that you yeah. need to. So, so, you know, looking at it's a, it's a concept, you know, it's funny when I, back in the day, when I, when I worked at Dell, um, and, you know, that was a publicly, you know, traded business. And, and yeah, I was like, a, you know, entry level to mid level guy within Dell. Um, but, you know, I, I actually had a, a, you know, one of the general managers, more senior than me talked about it. He said, you know, what we do basically is we, you know, we take a pile of rocks, we move it from one side of the room to the other. And, and, you know, that's a quarter. And then the next quarter, we're going to move it back to the other side. Um, but this time there's more rocks, um, you know, and, and yeah, it's like, these are the rocks that we have to move this quarter. These are mm -hmm. the stones that we need to turn over this quarter um, right. in order to make that happen. And so, you know, mm -hmm. our rocks right now are, you know, and, and you can see on this, this video that we're on, I mean, I've got 1970s paneling in here and, you know, <laughs> one of our rocks is it's like, we're going to lose the paneling. Um, right you know, and, and, um, you know, we're going to five S the shop and, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of the baby step things that, that we need to do, you know, to get to, you know, that point where we're capable because by the way, we're not today, um, of delivering, you know, 500 work orders a month. Um, right. you know, we're, we're not capable of that today. Um, and sure. that's okay. Right. And, and, you know, one of the things that I, that I do constantly have to remind the team of is, is, you know, yeah, we've decided we want to eat an elephant. Um, but, you know, like we're just going to do it one bite at a time. You know, we don't have to worry about, you know, when we're going to finish or, you know, um, if we're going to finish, we just got to worry about, you know, the amount we think we need to do right now. Mm-hmm. Do you think that uh, 
in a, a well-engaged team, like it sounds like you're really fostering and building there, um, that if you set out the vision and the 10 year and the three year, one year goals, and then make sure each component of that is, you know, uh, well handled, uh, mm -hmm. that it's almost like a recipe for success. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, assuming you adapt to changes along the way and what, you know, be realistic. Yeah. The goals have to be, you know, realistic and achievable. Um, you know, but, but yeah, I think a million percent. Yes. Um, if, and we have to pick the right thing, right? Like we can't sit there and say, Oh, you know, we want to get to this level of business or, you know, add this capability to the shop and then decide that, you know, we're going to buy a barbecue grill and smoke brisket every day, right? We can't do that. Um, we sure. do have to pick the right things and the right sets of activities. Um, but yeah, look, if, if we pick the right sets of activities and we hold each other accountable for achieving those things and, you know, identifying issues along the way and solving issues as they come up, because um, that's another key part of EOS, um, you know, we should get there. Will we get there at exactly the time we thought we would? You know, maybe, maybe not. Um, there's a lot of things outside of our control. Um, but, you know, um, like I could tell you that my rocks, like my, Matt Boucher's rocks, because everybody in the organization has rocks. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you can, you can look on our vision track and organizer and, and, and see, um, who owns what, um, you know, my rocks are three by three by three, five by five, right? Those are the things that, that I have to do to make sure that, you know, we're going to have the top line or as I like to call it the oxygen, um, you know, to, 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 to be able to, to meet those objectives, right? Cause it, cause you know, ultimately it all starts with, with sales, um, in any business, not just a machine shop. If, if you're not driving sales, um, you know, you're not going to be a healthy business for, for long. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, others have other rocks and, and, you know, if, if we're not, you know, if we're not five Sing the shop and we're not, you know, um, uh, you know, implementing the operational improvements that we want to implement this quarter or next quarter, you know, whichever one it is, then, you know, all these sales that we're getting, we're going to start missing deadlines. We're going to start having quality problems. And, and so, you know, and then we'll fall on our face and then, you know, um, look, people will give you a chance, but they very often won't give you a second chance. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really does become a thing where we have to be accountable to each other for, for getting all of these things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, did you, when you, bought the company. I'm just curious to maybe if you could outline a little bit of the first steps, sure. um, you know, coming in, meeting the folks for the first time, introducing yourself, your vision and getting their buy-in and collaboration. Can you just share a little bit about what that was like? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, having bought businesses before, um, you know, one of the things that I've, that I've learned over time is that, you know, people want to build a personal connection. And so, you know, the most important thing that, that I could do coming in as the new leader of the organization was, you know, establish like, you know, one, um, things are going to change, but hopefully they're always going to be changing for the better. Um, now look, that's not realistic, right? Sometimes things are going to happen and it's going to like stink. Um, but, but that, you know, establish that, that, you know, my heart as a leader is, is about, you know, improving not only the business or growing the business, right? Cause, cause to say the business needs to be improved probably isn't fair. It was a fine business. Um, you know, but, 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 you know, growing, and transforming the business into something that creates opportunities, not just for me and my family, but for everybody involved in the organization. Um, uh, you know, that to convince them to, or to tell them that that is what, you know, was in my heart. And, and then, you know, and then to make sure that every single day, you know, 
I show up and demonstrate that. Um, and, you know, I, a whole bunch of ways to do that. You know, um, the company that I bought was MJ Machine Shop, and now we're called the Machinosaurus Manufacturing Company, um, <laughs> yep. which, uh, you know, I don't know that anybody's making dinosaurs, although I think that would be pretty awesome if somebody could figure out how to make <laughs> one of those. Um, Jurassic Park aside. Um, yeah. But, but uh, you know, so I showed up with Machinosaurus T-shirts, and you know, we, you know, I made sure that we brought in lunch the first day and, you know, I brought my wife and my kids and said like, this, this is a family business and, and we want it to be a family business. And, um, you know, uh, I told them my background, um, and, and, you know, I made it clear that, that, you know, we, we were buying this shop as an investment opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as a business that we wanted to see grow, um, and that, you know, we wanted to partner with them to create that growth and to create those opportunities, you know, for everybody on the team. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that's, you know, how, how it started. And, and like I said, you just then get to show up every single day, you know, and be consistent. And, you know, my observation is that's true for like anything. Right. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to go like super hard every day, but you do have to be super consistent every day. Um, and and, um, you know, uh, that consistency, I think, will will pay off. Right. So like to go back to it, um, I know that in order to hit our sales objectives, we have to identify 10 new people to contact every single day. And so I spend you know, an hour, hour and a half a day, making sure that I'm identifying those people. And the very next day, I'm touching those people. And, right. um, you know, and then I know that, you know, um, like a few things is gonna ha are going to happen. Um, they're going to come back and say, yeah, let's do something. And that's awesome. Not super common, at least on the first, sure, first try. Of course. Um, you know, uh, second thing that's going to happen is they're going to ignore me. Right. They're, I'm not going to get them. Mm -hmm. They're going to ignore me. Um, and then, you know, the third thing is they're going to say, please go away. Chew fly. Don't bother me. Um, and so, look, that's OK. Right. Because I actually appreciate that. You know, that person has done me an exceptional favor. They've mm -hmm. told me that they're not interested in hearing from me, which means that I don't have to spend any time trying to contact them. Um, and and, you know, that is, you know, some people see that as rejection. I see it as a blessing. Um, and, you know, so then I know that, that for each of those people that I've contacted, I've got to contact them now another seven times. Yep. Um, you know, because salespeople too often don't ask for the sale enough times. And by the way, I ask for the sale every single time. Right. You know, I always sign up. Do you have any work we could bid? Can we give you a market check? Um, you know, can we help you be more successful? Yeah. And you know, you'd be amazed at just like ask every time. Um, and so, you know, those are the consistency things that I know that, you know, we need to do to be successful from a sales perspective. And, you know, I know that I need to consistently be here at six o'clock in the morning when the guys are showing up and, you know, I need to consistently be, you know, the one who's locking the door, um, right. you know, and, and, um, you know, it's that consistency. And then, you know, um, always, always, always treating people with respect and dignity. Um, you know, um, you, you tend to tend to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that we are family. That's part of, that's one of your core values, right? That is, that is. And, and you know, look, I, I tell you, you know, we, we talked a little bit about it. I was in the private equity world. Um, and there's so many brilliant people in that world and, and, you know, super smart, super educated, super ambitious. Um, but you know, it's also a very, you know, aggressive, you know, um, kind of, you know, we're always going to make the right business decision, um, kind of a place. And, you know, I, look, sometimes, you know, the work does slow down in a shop. And, you know, the right business decision might be to cut back hours or let people go. And, you know, um, 
look, I've done that so many times in my career um, where I've had to be the person delivering that, that message that somebody you know, who showed up every day and did a good job just wasn't going to have a job anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I not saying I'll never do it again, but, but, you know, I hope to never do it again. And, you know, that isn't always going to be the right business decision, but it is the right decision when you're trying to treat it like it's a family. Mm-hmm. Well, ultimately it, it may be the right business decision when you take the very long picture in yeah. mind and yeah. the, you know, the loyalty you'll build. I wanted to ask, right. did you do an ESOP? You talked about this 20% uh, to the employees or? You know, right, right now, the way it's structured is, is it, it's really just a profit sharing plan. Um, okay. it, it's almost like profit <laughs> interest. I guess is how I would describe it. Um, okay. So you're granted profits cool. interest. Right. So does that mean you're fairly open book with your team? Yeah, I'm super transparent. Okay. Um, I share with them where the sales are, where the backlog is, where the profitability is, where the cash flow is. Um, and, you know, uh, look, you know, the, the the team in the shop, you know, they're not, it's not like, you know, they have, you know, MBAs, right. Uh, you know, they, they haven't been exposed to these sort of things before. Um, but I'll tell you, my view is that, um, you know, the best businesses that within the best businesses, um, people have great from top to bottom. Um, and it's a relative thing, right? Of course, the CEO would have more than somebody, you know, sweeping the floors, but people have solid business and financial acumen. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, when, when the team has that, then, you know, sometimes when you have to make the harder decisions or the trade-offs, and I'm not talking about like laying people off, but like, hey, you know, we're not going to get that machine right now, or we're not going to do, you know, this initiative right now, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, if you've helped the team develop business and financial acumen, then like they get it a little bit easier. Um, sure. and, and quite candidly, you know, when you help them understand, um, you know, this is what an income statement is. This is what a balance sheet is. This is what a, you know, cash flow statement is. These are how they work. This is how they work together. Um, this is what return on assets is. This is what return on equity is. You know, these types of things, when your team understands that or has, you know, some inkling into that, then, you know, I'm going to go back to, to, you know, intellect, right? It just, it fires up ideas. Hey, I know a way that we could improve return here. Um, you know, Matt, we've got an extra drill press and an extra bridge port that like we don't use and the likelihood of us ever using all three of them at the same time is somewhere between zero and zero. (laughs) So let's sell it. Let's Let's sell it. And, you know, let's put, you know, a new CMM right there or, you know, whatever it is. Um, right. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, having them come up with those ideas and, and, and tell me those things is, you know, is, cause I'm not a machinist, right? I'm an economist by training. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, it's really powerful. And mm-hmm. so, so I am super transparent with them about it. That's fantastic. I wanted to ask um, on the more sort of tactical level of, you know, X number of work orders, per per month and revenue mm-hmm. goals. Mm-hmm. And because you alluded to this a little bit, like, you know, kitting the jobs, kitting the tools on a cart, kitting the boxes mm-hmm. you're gonna need. Um, you know, the the thumb drive for the, with the program. Uh, a lot of that comes down, I mean, must come down if you're processing, you know, a thousand jobs a month, five hundred jobs a month, you gotta have a really quick, efficient flow of a process, right? There can't be a lot of mm-hmm. waste in 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 that. Um, mm-hmm is uh uh and what you described with <laughs> with the kidding it's so funny it's like pretty much exactly what we did at our shop right okay we, we called it pre-processing the job and we had you know one of the big rubber made carts <clears throat> and we had yeah. the cutting tools in a caddy mm-hmm. touched mm-hmm. off in their holders torqued ready to go we had uh, any fixtures you need. We had mm-hmm. any special gauges, you know, you need a special STI thread gauge. So let's make sure that's ready to go. We had the boxes and the bubble bags because we would do as much packaging in flow as we could because we were trying to get rid of some of those <clears throat> eight wastes. Right. Um, and uh, 
so yeah, we called it the pre-processing checklist. And, uh, but how, like going down to that level of nuance, did you already have that in your mind before you bought the shop? Or was that something that the folks said, Hey, you know, I see an opportunity to increase our job velocity by doing this process. So, um, no, I didn't have it in my mind. Um, you know, I, I came in to a shop that had been run, you know, basically inside, you know, one person's head for the last, you know, whatever it is, 23, 24 years, something like that. Right. And, um, you know, the first thing I did was sort of learn his process, right? So we didn't set up a, like our work order, job order system um, until, you know, probably three weeks in. Um, that was really one of the first operational improvements we made, um, you know, with job instructions and that sort of thing. Um, and, and so like, actually the team came up with that one. Um, you know, I taught them about the eight forms of weight. That was one of the things in one of the meetings, they didn't didn't know that, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the guys kind of did. You know, the person we hired when, when, um, you know, my wife and I acquired the shop had been in a, a larger shop, you know, with, you know, pallet loaders and lots mm-hmm. of machines and that sort of thing. And so you know, he had some exposure to it, but, but, you know, I wouldn't say that, that he had been, you know, like grounded in it or that they were having, you know, Kaizen events and, you know, sprints and all these other things that, that, that mm-hmm. you can do within that. Um, but, but, you know, I, I introduced them to it and I said, you know, guys, um, when I, and, and at that point I kind of knew, again, I, I sort of knew where we needed to go. Right. Um, you know, but, but I couldn't just say, Hey, this is how we're going to do it now. Um, mm-hmm. or I guess I could have, but I, I don't think it would have taken hold as quickly. Um, sure. you know, and, and so, you know, I, um, I, I taught them about it and I, and I said, you know, where could we, you know, eliminate, you know, transportation, where could we eliminate motion, you know, mm-hmm. um, over processing, you know, et, et cetera. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, they, you know, they came up with it mm-hmm. and, you know, um, and look, it, it's evolving. Um, so it's, it's not like, Um, it's standing still right now that like, we've, like, we've got it nailed. And what we've now got is, is like fully scalable to like, you know, a business that's 10 times the size we are today. You know, I think Mm -hmm. some of the general principles, yeah, sure. They're scalable. Um, the way we're implementing it today, you know, fully not scalable. Um, you you know, yeah. And, 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 you know, it's, look, it's always a function of, you know, like resources and, and, you know, how much you can put into one thing at any one time. Um, And the most precious of those is, is time, right? Like we could take the time to make sure that like we've built a battleship that can go to like, you know, world war three or, you know, Hey man, we got a boat. Let's get in the fight. You know, we, we got an outboard motor. We're going to go. Um, sure. you know, and so, um, it, it will evolve uh, along the way. And, and I mean, I'll tell you, you know, we've, we've, we've sort of had a, a, a recent pretty nice spurt and we're already having to think through, okay, how does this now need to evolve so that we don't fall completely on our face? And so those are the kinds of things that we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, every week in our meeting is, is, all right, how are we gonna, you know, um, how are we going to handle this? Um, and, and, you know, I think that's okay. Some people would say, oh, you know, that's, that's inefficient. You just got to the end point. But, you know, I, I'm not sure that's realistic. Um, you know, it, it, it does need to be an evolution. And, and you know, uh, our shop's probably going to do it slightly differently than some other shop does it. I mean, I think generally – it's all going to be kind of like mostly the same, right? Um, mm-hmm. if, if you're going to eliminate um, the amount of times you're touching a part or moving a part or moving your body or whatever it is, I mean, ergonomics or ergonomics, uh, but, mm-hmm. but, 
you know, the way we'll do it might be a little different than, than the people down the street who do it really well do it. And I'm not saying we do it well. I think we're just, you know, um, we're taking some baby steps right now. We've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. This is all really good. Um, I had a question that just escaped my mind. Um, oh yeah. So you bought this shop that was largely run out of the owner's head. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what you paid for it and you don't need to disclose that, but I, I'd love for you to share like just sort of, um, in scale, like what that's worth compared to a business that is already run on process that isn't totally dependent on yeah. the owner's head. Uh, cause I, I want to inspire people to get their businesses out of their heads build a process and that will bring value to them and their families, even if they don't see it directly. Yeah. Um, so let's just talk about um, trading ranges. Um, sure. And, you know, uh, for, for people who, who aren't familiar with it, um, you know, uh, I think in businesses like these and, 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 you know, any kind of privately owned business that's going to sell generally is going to sell for some multiple of, you know, profit, right? The tip, the most common profit metric used in business transactions to buy private businesses is EBITDA. Um, and so that's earnings. And then you add back taxes, you add back depreciation, you add back amortization. Um, so it's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, and, you know, I will tell you that I pay two times for this business. Okay. Um, two times EBITDA. Um, I think had the shop been more advanced with things like, you know, more readily visible processes, maybe using more machining technology. So like not just being a three axis shop, for example, um, having certification, um, et cetera. Um, then, you know, given the size, it probably still would have traded for maybe a four. Um, but twice like when you do the, Twice the value, right? So if, if and you the, know. And the earnings were probably would have been higher. <laughs> and the earnings would have, oh, the earnings for sure would have been higher. Um, yeah. So let's just say that the earnings were, you know, $100. Um, then, you know, I pay $200 for the business. Um, mm -hmm. If, you know, the earnings had been $100, but the business had had more process, more definition, you know, maybe some of the certifications, which we don't have yet either, but, we, you know, we're, we're beginning yeah. the journey to achieve. Um, you know, then maybe I would have had to pay four hundred dollars for it, um, or three hundred dollars for it, right? And and look, I mean, that's a way to double your money if you, if you're an owner. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but but likely um, if they had built those processes, done some oh, of the things that would have made it attractive, they could have had you know two hundred dollars in earnings, three hundred dollars, and then that could have been multiplied four x. So I, I think without <laughs> question, right? So it, it wouldn't have been the same hundred dollars. It would sure. have been, yeah, it would have been a business that was making $200 that had to be sold for $800, right? So, so mm -hmm. when you implement the processes, um, yeah, you get the benefit of the additional earnings, which by the way, you can put in your pocket, you know, every month or every quarter or however you want to manage yeah. that as the business owner. Um, but then, yeah, instead of having a hundred that got multiplied by two, you have 200 that got multiplied by four, you, you just made a, a bunch more money. Mm -hmm. um, as, as the person selling the business. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and Such a powerful concept, you know, and so, you know, that's how, how, you know, I thought about the business, right. I mean, I do come from the private equity world and, you know, um, you know, that's multiple arbitrage, right. That's what we're talking about here is, is, you know, and I knew quite candidly, um, you know, full transparency, Matt Boucher is an open book. Um, you know, I knew that I was buying a business for two times earnings. And I knew that if we were successful and that not guaranteed um, that, you know, but, but that if we implemented a, a, you know, highly process driven business, um, a highly, you know, um, systemized business. And I don't just mean like computer systems, but like a business where you have processes and systems in place to accomplish your objectives and you're consistent about following those processes, I knew that we could, you know, A, not only grow the business, but B, um, have a business that at some point, if we choose to sell it, will be worth not just more because it makes more, 
but also more because somebody is willing to pay a higher multiple for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a good investment recipe for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, uh, that's probably a good place for us to wrap it up. Um, and, uh, I think it's such a poignant place to stop because everything we you've talked about over the last hour, uh, you know, putting in process, engaging the team, having core values, uh, the whole traction, you know, EOS system is it's, it's a recipe for wealth creation and prosperity for your team as well. Um, and, uh, I think it's, it's a really inspiring vision and I I super glad you shared it with us. And I know people are going to, uh, get a lot from this, uh, because it's a, it's a very logical, but unique perspective that you have based on your vast experience, uh, that's really well informed and uh is it's it's exciting i think it's inspirational i really do so thank you yeah um thank you for being on the show thank you for sharing your experience and being enthusiastic about the machine shop industry and business you know it's 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 a great time to be making chips right now you know we've got so many we've got so many tailwinds um behind us and and um you know i'm just super excited to, to be here. And, um, you know, I've talked to other machine shop owners now and, you know, every one of them has been kind and helpful. And, um, you know, it's just, it's been a great experience so far and, you know, I hope to continue it for a long time. Yeah, it really is, uh, an amazing industry and you're right. It's filled with people that are so happy to share, share Mm -hmm. ideas and their experience, lend you a tool and, you know, I think we realize we're all kind of in this together. And, uh, you know, I I agree that the tailwinds right now are, are very strong. And if you can combine those tailwinds with a a bigger sale, like you're building, all these business processes are like a big sale to help propel the business forward. I think Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's just a a fantastic vision and a good time to have it. Thank you. All right. If people want to get a hold of you, how would you suggest they go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, look, I'm always thrilled to talk to folks and, um, you know, reach out to me anytime. Um, you can go to our website. It's uh, machinosaurus.com. So it's machine, just like in machine shop, O-S-A-U-R-U-S.com. Um, I'm M-J-B, that's Matthew Joseph Boucher, at machinosaurus.com. Um, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, we're on Instagram. We're trying to drive social media in all kinds of different ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, you can find us. Um, and, and, <laughs> it's not a good space, Machinosaurus. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it is. And, and look, uh, you know, I, I, hey, I, I'm happy to teach anybody the selling system. Um, I don't view... Uh, other machine shops as, as competitors. I think that there's, you know, I mean, at least what I'm finding is there's, there's so much available work. Um, mm-hmm. And candidly, yeah. there's so many people who are retiring from this space um, yeah. that, you know, there's, there's probably more opportunity than there is capacity f- to fulfill it. And, um, Couldn't agree more. Yeah. you know, if we could all be successful together, then, you know, that's, that's a win. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you again so much. Really appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to uh, getting the feedback that I'm sure people will love this episode. All right. Well, thanks. And um, yeah, I, I hope so. And, and thank you, um, Paul. It's, it's been great. All right. Thank you, sir. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.